Lovely to be back again, isn't it? On this lovely, chilly evening. Yes. Praise the Lord. I want to just share something with you this evening. I hope it will be a help to you. I've looked at this for a little while uh, in my own studies, and uh, I'll refer to something I saw. I was in Israel this year. Have any of you been to Israel? It's the most wonderful experience, I have to say. It brings the, the Bible to life. But I saw a few things there that I found very interesting. And I want to read a psalm to start with. So if you have your Bible, please follow with me. It's probably the most familiar psalm. What do you think I'm... It's not... It's not 130... It's not 23. Psalm 23. I wonder, was it read yesterday at the, at the funeral service? 139, right? Okay. Often Psalm 23 is read at a, at a funeral service. And for a lot of folk, it's their favorite psalm because it talks about the Lord being our shepherd. But I want you to see a particular phrase in it this evening that I want to talk about for a few minutes. But let me just read it to you. This is the New King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, when I was a kid, I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. He's my shepherd and I don't want him. Uh, it's obviously, I shall not be in want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is a fantastic passage of Scripture. There's one word in that that is not what I'm speaking on tonight, but I was, at a, I was in Cornwall last year, actually at an IGO conference, and one of the guys there said he'd been studying that. You see in verse 5, the end of verse 5, it says, My cup runs over. That word that, that's translated runs over only comes twice in the Bible. That particular translation of the word, that particular form. And it means a wealthy place. It's a wealthy place. My cup runs over. Now, this is David. And David wrote most of the Psalms. He was a psalmist, probably the greatest worship leader that ever lived. And uh, he wrote some incredible words. But the phrase that I want you to take note of tonight is verse 5. Look what it says. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I think I'd rather God was to say, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your friends, or in the presence of the church, or in the presence of your family. But here, David's testimony is this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And the bit before it and the bit after it talks about blessing. He says, okay, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil, you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then you prepare a table. My, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So that's what I want to look at just for a few minutes this evening. The idea that he prepares something for us in the presence of our enemies. Now, let's face it, through 2017, there were probably times when you thought the enemy was giving you a hard time. Probably times when you think, he's on my case. Every one of us. We have all different circumstances. We all come from different places, different things to face. The older we get, the different challenges we ha have. As you get older, health becomes a greater challenge. Mobility can become a greater challenge. When you're younger, finance can become a great challenge. Relationships can become a great challenge. And whatever way we would want to describe our life, every one of us will at some way, we could actually say it tonight, there are probably things you could think of where you would say, that's the enemy giving me a hard time. All of us could do it. It might be in your workplace or it might even be in your home. I don't want to be specific. specific. That's up to you this evening. But all of us at times will feel like we're walking through difficulties. When I was in Israel a few months ago, we went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. 
Now, Caesarea Philippi is up in the northwest of Israel. And there, there are three passages I'm going to read to you, just, just refer to this evening. Psalm 23 is my text, but there are three passages that I'm going to refer to. Caesarea Philippi was a place where Jesus brought his disciples. He wanted to teach them a lesson, so he, he brought them there. It's in Matthew chapter 16. But let me tell you something about it. When you go to Caesarea Philippi, the place is called Banias or Panias. And Panias was a, a, a god, a godlike creature that was half goat and half human. And as you go up to Panias, you walk up a hill, and you can't notice it today because there was an earthquake somewhere in the Middle Ages that destroyed this. But there was as a massive cavern when you get up to this actual place. It's a massive cavern that was one of the sources of the River Jordan. So as you walked up to it, you would hear the gurgling and the rushing of the water from deep down the earth. Now also, there was a couple of, of big buildings there. One was dedicated to Caesar, which I guess called Caesarea Philippi. The other one was built uh, to a god and worship of this god, Panias. And they used to sacrifice goats there. And so the noise of the goats and the noise of the water gushing from deep below, they used to call it the gates of hell. And so when you go there, they, they, of course, in that day, very much people perceived heaven as being up there and hell as being, we talked about the depths of hell. So in that day, people thought physically, of course, we still believe physical heaven and physical hell, but in this era, hell was very far down, heaven was very far up. And so when the Jewish people described this place with the noises that came from it and the extremity of the sacrifice that came from it, they called it the gates of hell. So no Jewish boy would ever have been there. They just wouldn't be allowed to go to it. It was, it was a no-go area. And so in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus brought his disciples there. It must have been such a shock to them because they shouldn't have gone. They wouldn't have asked permission from their families. It's just Jesus said, come on, guys, I'm taking you out on a little trip today. So we read about it in Matthew 16. I'm going to read from verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to, said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So here's these guys who should not have been there to their own understanding, and Jesus brings them right into enemy territory, and he gives them a revelation. He starts to speak about the church, how the church actually was designed not to defend, but was designed to attack the gates of hell, and it was designed to take back what the enemy had stolen. So you are here in this town here in Cheadle, not to defend, but actually to take back what the enemy has stolen. Because it's the enemy who is the one who is the trespasser. The enemy is the one who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has promised people in Cheadle that they can have life and have it more abundantly. And that's why he's raised you up here. But the interesting thing for me is Peter. Well, when you think about Peter, Peter was an amazing character, always putting his foot in it, of course. But he was an amazing character. Peter was the one who, just a couple of chapters earlier, walked on the water. Nobody else had ever walked on water, but Peter did. Peter was the one who, do you remember when they asked, should they pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus said, hey, where you go, catch a fish, open its prize, open its mouth, you'll find a coin in there. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? So Peter gets a coin to pay his taxes. Peter's one of the ones, along with others, who saw the water change to wine. 
Peter was one of the ones, along with others, who saw the five loaves and the two fish feed a multitude. So when you look through the story of Peter, you'll find that it's a, a revelation after revelation. But isn't it interesting that it's in this place, in the camp of the enemy, where he finds out who he really is? And so in the presence, in the enemy's camp, that's where Peter found his identity. And what I want to suggest to you this evening is that actually, rather than, and it's not really in church or when we're in fellowship, but we really find out who we are in God when we're put with our head against the wall, and we're put in, our, in, a, in a, a hard place. That's when we discover who we really are. It's when the guys make fun of you at work. It's when you're given a hard time by the girls in the office. It's when your family think that you've lost it by going to church or whatever. That's when actually we discover who we really are. So in 2018, you may find that God brings you or takes you into what seems to you to be the enemy's camp. And what I'm suggesting to you tonight is that we don't throw up our hands in horror and bind everything that flies around the place and say, oh, I can't wait to get out of this. Maybe God has brought you there because he wants to actually reveal something incredible to you in the enemy's camp. So in the enemy's camp, you find your identity. We don't want to be in the enemy's camp, but I find my text is this, that, that Jesus prepares or God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. So what we've, got to, we've got, what we've got to learn to do as children of God is not, not learn how to flee the enemy, but learn how to feast even in his presence. Because the presence of God is stronger than the presence of the enemy. And when we're in the enemy's camp, God is still there. He's still with us. Now, I find that very encouraging because maybe we're all going to face some challenges in 2018. Be encouraged. Cheer up. <laughs> the second one is in 1 Kings chapter 17. It's another place that I passed when I was in Israel. I passed, I passed a place called the Brook Cherith. What happened at the Brook Cherith? Who, what prophet do we think of when you hear the word the Brook Cherith? Elijah. What happens is Elijah... He was the prophet in Israel, and there was a wicked king. And the wicked king was called Ahab, one of the most wicked men that has ever lived. And King Ahab had an even more wicked wife. What was her name? Jezebel. She's still used as a byword for women that aren't too good. Jezebel. You Jezebel. And this, this family were really... Bad news for Israel. So what happens is in 1 Kings and chapter 17 is that here we have this guy Elijah and Elijah has proclaimed that there won't be rain for three and a half years. And so there's, there's going to be a famine in the place because you know rain, nothing else is going to grow either. And so God, what God does is in 1 Kings chapter 17, the first few verses, Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel is before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. And the Lord came to him, the word of the Lord, saying, Get away from here, turn east, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it shall be that you will drink from the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there." And so that's what happened. He was feeding there. But look at verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. By the way, the ravens are the greediest birds that there are. God chose the greediest to come and feed him. And he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there'd been no rain in the land. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, Go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Now, I'm not going to read you. You know the story of Zarephath and the widow. The point is this. God said, I want you to rise up and go to Zarephath. It says where it is. It's in Sidon. Sidon was on the Mediterranean coast, still on the Mediterranean coast, that area just over 
uh, by that big sea. And where, where Zarephath was, was 85 miles away, approximately. And there are no buses, no taxis. He had to walk 85 miles. Now, the, here's the interesting thing for me. Is Sidon, the king of Sidon, his daughter was called Jezebel. And the king of Sidon was the number one, if you like, in the whole nations who were the worshippers of Baal. And so the king brought his daughter up well to love him and to love their evil God. And her plan was to destroy Israel, but by making them worship Baal. So you remember when Elijah was up on the mountain, Mount Car Carmel, and there's 400 prophets of Asherah, or 450, whatever way around it is, prophets of Baal, and then he calls down the fire. Well, they were Jezebel's people. Jezebel was the one who raised up worshippers for Baal or Baal, depending on how you pronounce it. She was an evil woman, but her dad started it. Her dad was also an evil man. And the center of this evil worship was in Sidon. Zarephath was in Sidon. Now, here's the point. Here's this guy, Elijah. Elijah's hungry. Well, he's, he's not. I suppose he's eating the bread and the, the meat brought by the ravens, so he's okay. But he's run out of water, so he's, he's thirsty. God says, right, I want you to go from here. Now, if you, if you were negotiating with God, I think I'd have said to him, okay, God, where do you want me to go? You're going to go and you're going to provide me something to drink. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go down to the local KFC or whatever, or wherever it is you can provide for me. God says, I'm going to send you to Sidon. I'm going to send you. Not only am I going to put you to 85 miles you have to walk, but I'm going to put you right into the home ground of the lady who wants to kill you. You're going to go right to her house. Can you imagine Elijah might have had a problem with that? I mean, if you want to escape the enemy, where are you going to go? If, if the Queen of England, away in the old days, or the King of England wanted to destroy you, you're not going to get a bus to London. You'll go over to Ireland or somewhere where it's safe. But God sends him right into the enemy territory. And when he goes there, this lady, God says, I've commanded a widow to feed you. Where? Right in the enemy's tent, in the enemy's territory. So, basically, in the enemy's camp, my first point was this, you'll find your identity. My second one is this, you will find your provision. Right in the enemy's camp. What do you mean? Well, I, what I mean by that is the thing that the enemy wants to use to destroy you this year. Maybe there'll be a problem with your mortgage. The enemy will try to destroy you with it, but God will turn it around where that very problem that, he, that the enemy threw at you will become your deliverance. He'll turn it around and you'll get a better mortgage. The job that maybe you'll be made redundant this year, maybe it's because God has got a better one that's just waiting in the wing. The enemy thinks he's going to destroy you, but actually God's waiting to bless you far more than you could ever have been in the job that you're in right now. So what I'm saying is that, that in the enemy's camp, he prepares a table for us. And what we have to learn to do, what I have to learn to do, is to enjoy the presence of God where I am, not constantly give him a list of where I want to be but to enjoy his presence in the circumstances that I'm in right now, even though those circumstances might not be the way that you would draw them up if he gave you the plan that, you know, said, right, I want you to write where you'll be, because all of us would do it different. If we were given the right, if we were God Almighty, as, as the film, you know, for a, a day or two. Well, all of us would give ourselves a bigger salary for a start. We'd be in a bigger house. We'd have a nicer car. We'd have a better, you know, we'd do that, wouldn't we? Because that's the way we'd want to do it. But God knows what he's doing, and he's in control. And he wants us to learn how to feast at the table of the Lord that's set right now in the presence of our enemies. That's the second point. The third one, is also in the book of Kings, in 2 Kings chapter 7. And this is one of these ironic, uh, I, I think it's ironic anyway. When you read through it, it's the story of the lepers. There's a, the Samaria is sieged, and there are some four lepers outside the city, and they're dying. 
And uh, I'll read it to you in a moment. Basically, they come to this conclusion, we're dying. If we go back into the city, we'll die. If we go to the enemy, they'll kill us. We'll die. We're going to die anyway. So there's a certain logic to it, but it's what happens in it, in the, the enemy's camp, that is very interesting. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. This is to the city of Samaria. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we, we will enter the city, the famines in the city will die there. And if we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. That's the enemy. If they keep us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall only die. It's a great logical, isn't it? Isn't that lovely? And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And then they came back and entered another tent and carried from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we remain until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. We'll stop it there. I've heard this preached on many times and, and, and about the evangelism, but what I want to refer to here is that they went to the enemy's territory. And in the enemy's territory, God had set up a table for them right in the enemy's camp. And so they went there expecting to be killed, but they knew they were going to die anyway, so they may as well be killed, and there's a chance that the enemy would let them off. So they went, and God had turned it around. So my third point is similar to this morning, that in the enemy's camp you'll find your hope. Right in the camp of the enemy you will find your hope. So this year throughout this year, with all the circumstances that come upon us, wouldn't it be amazing if God took all the difficulty that he had, that we think are difficulties? So, for, for what do we think are difficulties? One of the things we find hard is telling people about the Lord. We find it hard to do that. Wouldn't it be amazing if your employer who you were praying for, who you think is obnoxious, but actually he's been waiting, and you tell him, you take up, pluck up your courage one day and tell him, and suddenly you find that God's been working in his life and he's been waiting for that moment to somebody to say, to tell him and give him the answer. Wouldn't it be amazing if the people you think that hated you, God turned it all around and rather than despising you, God gave them a love for you. He is able to turn the plans of the enemy to work for you. He's able to take up the wealth of the ungodly and put it into the hands of the godly. He's able to do that. He has the right to do that, and he has the authority to do that. So when I was planning, if you like this, in, in preparing this message, my thrust was this. Sometimes we, we look at our Facebook, or we look at our Instagram, or whatever social media any of us are affected by, and I discovered over this last year, people are very angry on Facebook. And we can get very angry. We tend to unfollow. My wife and I share a Facebook page, and we just unfollow people who are angry because we don't want to get angry. Because you could actually find your blood pressure going up just by before you get out of bed in the morning if you turn your phone on. I don't before I get out of bed. But if you did, you could find yourself having angry conversations before you even have your breakfast. How many of you know that's true? It is possible. But we can get angry over things that happen, and we won't, it won't change us. It won't change the circumstances. It just gets us a bit more depressed than we started the day off. When God wants us to learn how to feast at his table, even if it's in the presence 
of our enemies. Some, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm first to admit, I think some of the things the government do are pure stupidity. I think some of the things going on are ridiculous, but I find myself getting agitated by it. And it doesn't do me any good, let me tell you, or anybody who's listening to me. It doesn't do them any good either. And I don't post any of that sort of stuff on Facebook because you'll get a lot of angry comments if you did. When the whole thing in America over Trump and Clinton and all that went on, we kept off the face. I didn't post anything on Facebook, even though I have my opinions about it. The whole Brexit thing here, if I had put on about Brexit what I thought about it, we would have lost half my family. And because it divided people so much, you know that. It was very, and people do that on social media. What my thrust is this, is that whatever winds you up, and it can be good things or bad things, is we can, we can act so fleshly and we can respond to what motivates us or what gets us, what rocks our horse for another expression. But what I'm suggesting is this, is that actually throughout this year, there will be times when you and I are brought right into the camp of the enemy. And I have to learn in that place to be able to sit down at the table and feast in the presence of the Lord. I have to know what it is, according to Psalm 23, to allow him to anoint my head with oil and to see my cup overflowing right there in the presence of my enemies. And that's the promise that he wants to give us this evening. It's not that he doesn't want circumstances to change, and it's not that he cannot change circumstances, but I've discovered, probably the biggest secret I've discovered, is that my problem, my biggest problem in life, is me. By far, that's my biggest, it's not my wife, it's not my children, it's not my finances, it's not my car. My biggest problem, and God's biggest problem in my life, is me. And so it's not my circumstances that need to change. They will change. They'll come and they'll go. There'll be some times this year when you're fine, you look at your money and you'll think, wow, I didn't even realize I had that. I hope it happens to you every week. But there'll be other times and you'll think, oh my, it's near the end of the month. Sweetheart, I don't know how we're going to get through this month. Or the, the, the dishwasher breaks down, the washing machine breaks down, and something that, you, you've had those days, you know, when you think, oh Lord, I can really do without this right now. But in the midst of all that, I have to learn that it's me he's trying to change. So that he can say to me, Kinsey, would you shut up and just sit down? in the presence of the Lord, sure, but also in the presence of your enemies and learn how to commune and to fellowship with the King of Kings right in the presence of circumstances that I would not choose. And that's why I believe God took Peter and his friends and brought them up to Caesarea Philippi, a place that they would never have gone to voluntarily or naturally, and Peter said, and Jesus said, I'm going to teach you something here, Peter. Who do they say? Come on, what's people saying? What do you say? I want to know, have you got a revelation for me? In the presence of your enemies, have you, right at the gates of hell, the revelation that he had was you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, Peter, you're, I've, you're, you're learning something today. It's not the circumstances you're in that will dictate how high you rise. It's your revelation of me in the midst of those circumstances. That will dictate how high you rise. And today, Peter, you've risen high. And I'm telling you, no longer you're going to be called Simon. I'm going to call you Peter the Rock. And on this revelation, on the revelation of my word, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell, they will not prevail against it. If you stand on these revelations, you will sail to, and you will start reclaiming those people who were lost to hell. You'll start pulling them back into the kingdom of God. If you work in the revelation that God has given you. Folks, we need to be a revelation church, a people, a body of Christ, an individual who knows what it is to hear from him and to walk in the revelation that he gives us. And that came to Peter, probably for me, the greatest revelation that he ever had. He would have more revelations, he would have more intimate times with Jesus. 
Peter took him along. Peter was the one, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead, said that the angel said, go and, and tell the disciples. And Peter, he singled him out. Peter was the one who was singled out most of the time. Great, great closeness to, to Jesus. He was the one who, who he brought him alongside when he said, you know, feed my sheep. And three times, do you love me? And restored him in John 21. Wonderful revelations Peter had, but this was the greatest. And it was in the presence of his enemies. And I pray for you that throughout this year that in the presence, I hope you don't stay in the presence of your Don't get me wrong. Uh, this isn't a, a prophetic message that says this year is going to be an absolutely stinking year. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's not important. It's not the year. And it's not the circumstances, it's you and it's me. And I pray that whatever happens this year, that you and I will learn to sit at the table and enjoy the presence of our master, even if the enemy's flying all around. Because let me tell you, he cannot touch you. As you're seated at that table, you will still enjoy the anointing of oil and the overflowing cup. That promise of the overflowing cup, that place of wealth, was right in the presence of the enemies. That's where it was. There could be a famine going on. There could be a recession going on. There could be everything bottoming out. There could be uh, redundancies. And even so, the child of God who's learned how to sit at the table of the Lord can enjoy the blessing of God. There can be a marked difference upon the child of God in the middle of a recession where God can say, I'm going to just show the world here, you're my child, and I'm going to pour out my oil and my wine upon your life, and you will be blessed. So I pray this year that you will be blessed above everything, and you'll enjoy it regardless of your circumstances. Father, I pray this evening, Lord, as we've looked at your word once again, and we see that you brought your children. Oh my goodness, we'd prefer that you kept them in the temple and, and revealed everything at a Bible study or in somebody's house around a cup of coffee. But Lord, you brought them right into the camp of the enemy. And there in that place, revealed who you were and revealed who they were. And so Lord, you set a table before us in the presence of our enemies. There, our head will be anointed with oil and our cup will overflow, and goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. So I pray for each one here listening to my voice this evening. I pray, God, that each one, whether listening now or listening later on, uh, um, by, uh, on the internet, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will write this word in our hearts so we will not be motivated, we will not be moved, Whatever happens to us, should the world shake, we will not be moved because we know how to sit at the table. So God, we commit ourselves to you tonight that whatever comes through this year, we will sit at your table and enjoy your fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.